Uh, two Christians left is Professor Jose Gabalondo. Uh, he is an associate professor of law at Florida International University College of Law. Uh, he was born in Santiago, Cuba. Uh, he joined the College of Law after working in financial market regulation at the U.S. Department of the Treasury, the U.S. Securities Exchange Commission, the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, and the World Bank. He has served as Associate Dean for Academic Affairs over at Florida International University. Uh, he teaches tax and corporate finance. His scholarship focuses on debt markets and, separately, heterosexual subject formation in law and has appeared in a number of excellent scholarly journals, including the Journal of Corporation Law. Uh, he has also presented at a number of excellent law schools, including the University of Chicago, Columbia, and Georgetown. Uh, he is a co-author of Corporate Finance, Debt, Equity, and Derivative Markets and their Intermediaries uh, in the American Casebook Series. He has been a featured speaker at meetings of the American Society for International Law, the American Association of Law Schools, the Latin American Law and Economics Association, and a number of others. There's too many there to list, so I had to, I had to cut that off. <laughs> he has a, there are a number more impressive institutions where he has spoken. Uh, One of the only good things that has come out of the financial crisis is the conviction that we have to do a better job of understanding the financial sector, especially I'm in the legal academy, so I'm happy that, that this panel was set up because another part of that is also promoting financial literacy. If people really are to exercise suffrage over the financial sector, they have to understand what's going on. I'm very grateful to Dean Johnson for including me. The title of my talk is Fiscal Ideologies and the Incredible Expanding Fed. In part, I'm going to dovetail with what Dean Johnson said, and I, I agree with his conclusions, and I'm going to qualify them and expand them a little bit. I'm going to do four things today. I want to situate the austerity growth issue that we're talking about today as part of a Hatfields-McCoy-style feud between rival philosophies about what ought to be the relationship between market and state, a, 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 a debate that goes back over 100 years. Second, I want to suggest that in the economic area, often it's under-articulated moral norms that underlie our conclusions, and, and, the, and, the, and the cognitive function served by these norms is to simplify what is otherwise very complex decision making about things that, um, that don't have an easy answer. Uh, third, I want to persuade you along the lines of what Dean Johnson said that, that the Federal Reserve's balance sheet growth was largely justified. And then finally, and this is the least developed thing because I'm going to count on you to critically examine my own assumptions, I'm going to try to come out of the closet about my own unstated moral assumptions. Now, let me start with the first part. 1913 is a great year to be, uh, 1913 years is 100, 100 years ago uh, this year, and it's very significant because I really think it's, uh, it, it's, it launches a century of modern fiscal management. 1913 is Woodrow Wilson's first year as president, and uh, several significant things happen. First of all, the Federal Reserve Act is, is, is passed that year, laying the foundations of central banking and, um, and monetary policy. The 16th Amendment is passed, clarifying that um, the federal government has a, has a right to uh, lay an income tax. And the Revenue Act of 1913 is passed, instituting the first income tax, well, the one that has survived constitutional s Supreme Court uh, review. That's, a, that's an important first step. Then I think come two major blocks of time. First comes what I think of as the heyday of the liberal establishment. It starts with, and I just, I just listed the presidents, although obviously you know, the congressional makeup matters uh, too. FDR and the New Deal, Truman, Eisenhower, a Republican, Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, a Republican, Ford, a Republican, Carter, a Democrat. I think of this as the liberal establishment because what was happening during this period was the construction of the federal state and thematizing the notion of the public. I think this is also the heyday of tax and spend Democrats. It's also a period of a certain amount of post-war prosperity. Robert Reich, in his book, Super Capitalism, he dates it a little differently. He has it go from like 45 to 70, but he sort of refers to the same period of, um, of prosperity. Now, the world changes uh, with Ronald Reagan. I think of that as the beginning of the conservative establishment. Sidney Blumenthal has written an excellent book explaining how this happened and how, in fact, it had been in gestation during the liberal establishment, getting ready to be born. Um, and, so, and, and that, I think, goes from uh, you know, Reagan, Bush, Clinton, a Democrat, although a very you know, centrist Democrat, Bush to Obama, a Democrat again, but a sort of centrist Democrat. And, um, and what's, what's interesting, what, what, what makes this a period, is that the notion of the public is under review. Uh, the federal government, uh, the, 
the uh, politicians toy with the notion of a, of a minimal state. It's the heyday of, of, um, of, non, of, 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 of deregulation. And I think this is the period of borrow and spend Republicans. And it's also you know, something that happens in our neck of the woods. A federal society is formed. And I think that begins to have a role in restructuring doctrine and the federal judiciary. So um, which brings us to the moment. And I wonder if this is another inflection point in these paradigms, and maybe we're entering a third uh, wave. I think Obama does represent that culturally, but maybe there's something fiscal going on. Okay, now how does that bring us here? There's a school of theorists in Europe who study what they call the social structure of accumulation. Their notion is that each historical stage of capitalism is matched with sort of a corporate social pact between different interest groups in society that reach an agreement, kind of a political economy equilibrium, so that accumulation can continue. I think that's true. And I think that the liberal establishment had, was one such SSA, then the, the neoliberal one was another one. And I think we're, we, you know, we're, we're reviewing that. So, which brings us to today. What is it that I think we've been talking about today? The questions that I think frame all of this is, first, some, some normative. And by normative, I mean what should you do? disputes about ends and first principles. Who is part of the state? Should I care about anyone else? What should the state do? Who should pay for it? These are some of the bedrock questions that, that, I, that I think the first principles we're dealing with. And also technical, dispute, technical disputes about means. How does the market really work? Because I think one thing that's become clear is our notions of the market didn't work. Uh, someone earlier was saying that the way banks made loans is they said, well, if I can sell this loan, I'll make it. I don't care about the quality. In theory, that should work fine in a market because the secondary price of the, of, the, uh, of the origination, it should correlate with whatever the quality of the primary market is. So, so why didn't that work? Well, obviously, we don't, we don't know how the market really works. And the line you can't see here is, how does this government really work? Because this has also been an age of of state failure. OK, so let me expand on how I think we reason through these questions. And I'm going to be guilty of gross oversimplification, gross, gross, gross oversimplification, breaking with everything that's gone on in postmodernity. But I'm going to characterize these two paradigms that roughly correlate with the liberal, with the liberal conservative era. And I'm working off um, an idea that Michael Frieden, who's a professor of ideology at Oxford, does, which is he tries to break apart the conceptual, the different conceptual apparatuses, what they're made of, what their premises are, and how they relate to policy. And so this is my rough draft. And I and so I think we're 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 stuck between two paradigms. One is what I think of as, you know, the public liberal paradigm, and the other is the private conservative. The dominant values of the liberal power, uh, paradigm, social equity for the conservative, more personal liberty with respect to what is the relationship between the state and the market. The liberal paradigm recognizes, well, there's cyclical instability. It justifies state intervention. Hyman Minsky's financial instability thesis is probably the best example of that. Whereas con the conservative paradigm might say, well, the market's largely self-regulating, except when the state screws it up. Uh, with respect to the notion of the self, I think the liberal notion is it's socially interdependent with varying degrees of vulnerability. And, oh, I'm sorry, and uh, you know, con contrasted with a notion of a rugged individual, slightly atomistic. In terms of the nature of the state, and I'm sort of repeating myself, the liberal notion is more an active and broad-reaching state, and the conservative a limited one. Now, how do, this maps out onto a fiscal, a fiscal policy in, in different ways. Uh, the notion of growth is different. We've really been talking about different kinds of growth. When Romney talked about growth in the debates with Obama, he was using growth as a way of avoiding having to raise marginal rates. Because he said, we won't have to do that. Because we'll increase the base and, 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 and automatically through this sort of self-combustible and self-fueling process in a condition of liberty, there'll be growth. When liberals talk about growth, I think they mean more in Keynes' sense of aggregate demand, this notion that every now and then the government's going to have to um, fund counter-cyclical support. So we really mean two kinds of growth. Uh, when, um, Dr. when Tara was talking about the difference between an outcome and a, and a decision, she was, she was getting at that. 
tax policy, there's some important differences. Liberal, the paradigm supports progressive income and, I think this is correct, confiscatory transfer taxation. And conservative ap approach prefers consumption rather than an income tax, a flat rather than a progressive tax. And the notion of progressivity is different in the two paradigms. In the liberal paradigm, the determination of whether a tax burden is progressive is made at the level of the individual taxpayer, i.e., is there a uh, progressive ladder of rates that applies on higher levels of income. If you hear the con in the conservative paradigm, progressivity is understood to be satisfied. The requirement of progressivity is understood to be satisfied. If, m if higher income taxpayers pay more as a class, well, they might even do that under a flat tax. So I think it's a different notion of the very same word. Uh, and finally, I think that in terms of the fiscal approach generally, in the liberal paradigm, redistribution is the goal through taxation and means-tested spending, and borrowing is okay. And I think in a way the, con the conservative paradigm is very reactive about funding because they don't want to encourage the state. And if you have a funding paradigm, that might do that. So, um, so I think we're in that, uh, that's the first part of my talk. I wanted to situate where we, ha where, where we are historically in this century of ideologies about, about uh, fiscal affairs. Now, um, I want to move now to the second point, which is examining the role of unstated and maybe unexaminable moral assumptions in how we reach economic conclusions. And why I have this slide is because I guess I've noticed my own capacity for deep moral certainty in the face of, 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 of permanently contestable questions. And I think when I really got this, I do a lot of debates on, on TV, and I, I debate with the Cato Institute sometimes, and, and often I've had the experience where my sparring partner will make an excellent point that I haven't thought of. And of course, my immediate reaction is, how can I neutralize and deny that that's a good point? And then later, I'm going to think about that, because that's a really good point. And where that left me was realizing that I know that with certain social questions, like abortion and gay marriage, our notions about, our conclusions about that rest on moral first principles that precede and really survive data. Your views on these questions aren't going to be shaped by data. And I think there's, there, there are moral warrants. And I think si there's a similar kind of thinking at work in how we simplify economic, uh, economic questions. You know, the minimal wage debate might be like that. And I think one way to understand it is um, if you're going to make a database decision, you really have to only consider what you're certain of is going to happen in the first circle of causation. Because after that, there's all this mediated uh, you know, uh, causation that that, that dilutes what you want. So, so I might say these might be first principles, these notions of the state market relationship, the notion of the self nature of the state. It may be that those are at the, at the bottom of a lot of, uh, of our other um, uh, con you know, conclusions about decisions that are really could go either way. Now, what does the Fed have, all, have to do with this? I think the Fed is a wonderful thing to study in this moment for a variety of things. First of all, given what it does, I think it is intrinsically and permanently contestable. I think this notion, you know, sometimes there's this notion of, in, in thinking that you can have a first best solution against which you judge second best. I don't think you can have a lot of first bests when it comes to what the Fed does because it has self, it has contradictory mandates, not only between inflation control and full employment, but even within each of those. And I think arguably it has a third mandate now, financial stability. So I think what's interesting about the Fed is you really have to be honest that there's, it's all trade-offs there. And so it's an interesting way to analyze trade-offs. Second, I think the Fed's fascinating because on this question of public, private, state, and market, the Fed is the intersection of these state and market powers in a very interesting way because, yes, it's, a, it's, a federally, it's, a, it's created by a federal statute. It has a monopoly power to collect seniorage by printing money. But it also, it's very much a creature of the state in that it, it does its open market operations through the price mechanism. It has to buy at a premium and sell at a discount to induce free banks to trade with it. And that's very interesting. Um, the third reason why I think it's relevant is, you know, the Fed's a market maker for treasury debt. I think this came out already. The Fed has this, um, has this account, the system open market account, which is where all of the, 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 the system's securities are. SOMA is also, if you remember, the drug in Brave New World, which is used to pacify the masses. And SOMA is like that, too, because liquidity does have that stultifying effect on consciousness. Um, and so, and so that's, that's very relevant to uh, fiscal, and something that, that has been mentioned, and I really appreciate it, 
the the looking at the same looking at monetary and fiscal policy and banking supervision that was a third thing that was added today together i think you do have to look at all of those together and it just so happens the fed does all of those okay so um, i'm not going to repeat what um the the uh the programs that dean johnson um mentioned i'll just going to distinguish between two of them i think the first stage was uh liquidity stabilization and uh, I wrote an article called Financial Hospitals that explains this in much more detail if, if you want to look at that. And that was really through the end of 2008. And then has come this more conventional monetary project of long-term of credit initiatives. And, and I admit that there's a, uh, you know, there's a, the liquidity credit distinction is, is, is not a perfect one. They're, they're both aspects of monetary policy. But I think it, this distinction helps to isolate what financial stability measures involve. Now, this produced a, a, a backlash of, of criticism against the Fed. And I was fascinated by the backlash because it came from the right and from the left. And at once, the Fed was accused because it was too big and not big enough, too active and not active enough. And I just thought, that's fast. That's fa it reminded me of when I was associate dean and faced the criticisms of that <laughs> sort of internally inconsistent way. And I thought, that's, what's, what's behind these criticisms? And, and I'm just going to, um, and, and some of it had to do with the Fed's, uh, what the, Fed has, the Fed has a corporatist capital structure. I just want to spend a minute on what I mean by that before I get into the criticisms. It's a public, it's a, it's a public institution in that it's, it's, a, it's stock, it's preferred stock is owned by, by share by by banks, commercial banks own the Fed, and the uh, but the real ec you know the equity partner is the is the U.S. Treasury, the General Fund, because that money goes to, um, to 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 the Treasury directly. And I think we should be more honest about the fact that we do have a corporatist relationship to banks. We really do. In fact, you know, we banks are supposed to serve the special social function of borrowing short and lending long, and we reward them with access to the federal uh, the discount window and a bunch of other facilities. And so I think there's a way in which you know, our relationship to banks is you know, the way a parent deals with a wayward teenage child. I mean, you, sort of, you set standards for them. You hope they do well. But you know they're going to misbehave. And you know banks are going to be illiquid because they're set up to be illiquid, for heaven's sakes. Any institution that has to borrow short and lend long, it's going to be illiquid. So I think we have to recognize that we do have a special relationship to these banks. And, and we should uh, admit that. Okay. Um, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to spare you the discussion about the balance sheet um, of the Fed. But I'm going to point out one, one comment which relates to uh, what Dean Johnson said about the, the Fed has always been profitable, but it may have losses. And I want to explain to you how it will book the losses. It actually came up in, uh, in a House Financial Services Committee meeting this week. And it's, it's a fascinating thing. When I read about it, I laughed because I thought only the Fed. If the Fed makes less money in... In, in a year, then it, the way the Fed works is it, it pays its costs, it pays banks a 6% dividend, and then the rest, the residue goes to Treasury. In any year in which it doesn't make enough to do any of those things, what the Fed said they will do is they're going to book something called a deferred asset here. And what a deferred asset is this notion that, well, I don't have the money now, but I will. And then that will be offset by a liability for whatever the deficit is, so that you don't impair the capital. In a way, maybe it's, it's not that different from deferred tax assets, which you have on a private balance sheet when a firm has acquired tax benefits that will someday become cash. Become, so, but I just think it's funny. So that's coming. And when that comes, you know, people are going to make hay with that. But I just want you to understand the Fed has a, a, a bal you know, an accounting plan for it. And I think it kind of makes sense. OK. So let me just, I have uh, three, three or four minutes. So I'm just going to focus a little bit on I'm going to supplement the, uh, the objections that, that Christian made. Uh, in addition, uh, another, uh, another um, accusation was that the Fed behaved in an undemocratic and secretive way that, viola that violated basic notions of transparency and accountability. He talked about all the other ones. Um, I think it did. I mean, I think it did. The Fed has an accountability deficit, but it was democratically charged to act in a counter-cyclical, anti-majoritarian way. So it's supposed to have an accountability deficit. And in fact, people can exercise control over the Fed in terms of the appointment or non-reappointment of, um, of, of its leaders. It's just the long term. And we're, not, and we're used to accountability in the short term. So I, I don't accept. I demur to that. Yes, it's not accountable, and it's not supposed to be. Um, I, I, I want to add another point about the, the, um, 
the inter the, you know one of the ar arguments is that the Fed created a moral hazard. It did, and there was this loss shifting problem. It did. I can un I can accept that in terms of the the Fed's corporatist relationship to banks, but the Fed it's also interesting because you have to realize the Fed became the market. I mean, the Fed became there was no market for these instruments, and so the Fed became the market by adding term liquidity and uh, you know and price discovery to these uh, to these products and. And it worked, you know. So I think largely it uh, it did a, it did a very good job. Now I have I want to conclude by trying to identify my, my own hitherto unstated bases for my conclusion. I mean, why do I why do I reach this these conclusions? And so here I'm trying to do what I said we all do, which is reason from unstated moral assumptions. One is, I guess, a conservative fear of reform by the people who are in charge of, of these decisions today, and generally high regard for the Fed's conduct as a central bank. I think of this as, you know, I have an inner Burkean. Um, I'm sure you know, Edward Burke is spinning in his grave because I don't have, I'm not conservative about many things, but about this, about this institutional arrangement, I am. Because I think it has largely worked and it's entitled to a great degree of deference. So in terms of the Fed autonomy over, over these decisions. Um, and, you know, I'm skeptical about the, What's been behind a lot of the congressional criticisms of the Fed, and uh, and I've been I'm generally suspicious about majoritarian reactions to the Fed again because it's supposed to be an anti-majoritarian institution that everyone is going to dislike some of the time, because there's just no way that it can please uh, all of its constituencies. So um, I guess I'll I'll stop there, and I certainly look forward to your questions. Thank you for listening to me.